You are listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast series from the Conference Board, providing business leaders with trusted insights for what's ahead. Welcome to this episode of C-Suite Perspectives, a new podcast series by the Conference Board. C-Suite Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, data-driven look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business executives. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best, which is to provide insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this podcast series. And in today's conversation, we'll talk about all things capitalism, the benefits of our economic system, the challenges it faces, the role of business and the policy communities in keeping capitalism on a sustainable path. And I'm very excited today to have Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray join us. Lori is the president of the Committee for Economic Development, which of course is the public policy center of the conference board. Lori, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm uh, very pleased to be joining you today. Laura, you and I have talked about capitalism for years, and you know we've both been worried and proud and and uh, and worried some more. I think, you know, what is? Let's start with what is capitalism? I, you know, I in in this day and age when you have people saying, well, you know, I don't think I like capitalism. I like this thing over here. What is capitalism, and how has it proven itself to be the most enduring and successful economic system ever? Steve, that's a really important question and a very important way to start this conversation because I think today there is a lot of confusion about what capitalism is, especially among younger generations as opposed to the World War II generations. And so to start, capitalism, it's an economic system based on the foundational principle that free markets, the invisible hand, drive the efficient use of resources. So you have labor that is voluntary. You have capital mostly in private hands. You have production that is decentralized and motivated by profit. This is the exact polar opposite of what uh, Marxism-Leninism is, and that was the uh, titanic battle of the uh, 20th century. So capitalism embraces the value of competition, innovation, freedom of the individual. And I don't think it's an accident of history that Adam Smith uh, first wrote about capitalism in The Wealth of Nations in 1776, which was the year of the birth of America and American democracy. Look, yeah, and, and, he, and he was actually describing what he saw going on around him because the American system of government and economics was, was devised and put together together as one system that worked hand in glove, wasn't it? Exactly, exactly. And so you really cannot separate the role of the individual, the freedom of the individual, the voluntary labor that's involved in the fundamental principles of capitalism. You can't disassociate it from the strengths of democracy, which are based on all the same principles. Right. And, and, and this, this notion of free markets, Laurie, that you mentioned is, is really in, important and interesting. Every economist, you know, the, the definition of being an economist, whether you're an economist considers herself a, you know, a Democrat or a Republican or whatever the partisanship is, the belief is in free markets, right? That is the defining least common denominator. Exactly, exactly. And that's where the efficiency comes from. That's where uh, the growth comes from. And in the past uh, 75 years since World War II, under a capitalist economic system, the world has seen an unprecedented explosion in wealth. And we've also seen the collapse of the alternative market, which was the Marxist-Leninist communist system. Right. And, and in, in that process, um, billions of people really have been lifted out of poverty uh, by the by the strength of this system. Talk about that, because it's, you know, I, I think that the worry a lot is that, you know, the system leaves people behind and so forth, which and it's and it's, you know, it's it's not a perfect system and it's flawed, but it 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 has lifted a lot of boats. Uh, exactly, Steve. And that is the what really demonstrates the strength of the capitalist system. And this the switch actually actually came, um, you know, first there was after World War II, uh, the economies of Western, the Western economies, Western Europe, the U.S. But it was after the collapse of communism, and it was actually the uh, shift then uh, among 
a number of countries, but particularly in Asia and obviously particularly China, where uh, market principles were integrated into their economic system. So it was the failure of communist, communism. You saw Asia explode in terms of people being lifted out of poverty because of the exponential growth that happened with market principles being integrated uh, into the Chinese economy, uh, obviously, but also the other Asian, Asian tigers, uh, South Korea, uh, ASEAN, they really did embrace and recognize the strength of free enterprise and market principles. And, and those principles, if you look at those nations that have most fully embraced free economic principles, they have the highest standard of living and the highest GDP per capita in the world. I mean, you can almost graph it on, on the basis of how free and open the markets are, right? Right. And exactly. And, and actually, we shouldn't leave um, India out of this conversation as well, uh, which was also transitioning to more market principles in their economy. Uh, so it was a it was a dramatic historic turning point, uh, which is e even in and of itself an understatement with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the look to uh, market economies as the most efficient uh, way to really lift lift the boat, uh, really um, have a dramatic effect on poverty, which the World Bank's data shows that 40% of the world was living in poverty in 1990 when the Soviet Union fell, and we're now down to single digits. Of course, COVID is actually challenging that with the pandemic, but the exponential lifting of the boat, lifting people out of poverty since 1990 has, has uh, just been um, exceptional. That, that's a phenomenal set of statistics. 1990 was really not that long ago in the whole scheme of things. And and to, to think that, that you had that dramatic a shift across, what, seven and a half billion people on Earth, that's remarkable, Lori. And what's interesting, uh, Steve, is that um, I believe uh, the Great Recession, unfortunately, in 2008 was a setback. And so the incredible gains are of free markets, of capitalism, are somewhat clouded by the uh, reaction to the Great Recession of 2008. But you can't erase uh, those tremendous successes. Right. Now, there isn't one flavor of capitalism. I mean, and, and this is kind of, and there's not one flavor of socialism. And, you know, so people kind of label these things. But, you know, talk about the degrees, because the American style capitalism works because of American style government. You can't just take the system and drop it somewhere else. So, you know, it's an organic system that can be modified to the social norms, the social requirements, the, the you know, the legal system and so forth. And so, you know, you see that around the world and, and, and socialism. So, too. So there is a lot of capitalism that goes on, frankly, in China, which is labeled, you know, a communist uh, system. But it's all shades of gray. Right. So that's why you come back and you talk about, you know, the degrees of economic freedom. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, it really is when you're looking at China. You, you have to recognize that it was the shift. I mean, it is not the shift to as efficient of production, you know, uh, voluntary labor, but it was a shift to market principles that actually uh, had that dramatic effect of lifting so many people, uh, billions of people, hundreds of billions of people out of poverty in China. Yeah. Why do you, so why do we consider, you know, or why, why do economists consider capitalism uh, and the ability to produce, produce a profit, the most fair and equitable system? Because you use you, you hear those terms uh, a lot. And I think the challenges in people's minds are this fair and equitable system. Talk about that. Well, it's fair and equitable because it provides, you know, at its best, what capitalism is supposed to do is provide equal opportunity. And it's equal opportunity in terms of sharing and prosperity. So what does that mean? That means as businesses are uh, responding to consumer demands, uh, they're innovating and their uh, businesses go out of business, which is creative destruction. But we're, there's a continual, it's called creative destruction. So the what's not needed goes away, but it's a continual renewal in the economy. So you have innovation, new jobs being created, new business being created, and they're all responsive to consumer demand. And as you're providing for growth, you're providing for uh, income growth, and you're providing for more people to be working. And uh, that's your equal opportunity because labor is, is voluntary. It, it moves where the jobs are. There's mobility in the labor for force. And that's why it's a fair and equitable system. 
Yeah, and this creative destruction, you know, it sounds it sounds like a bad word, you know, destruction, but and and there are jobs that need to move and so people are affected, but you know, we don't need buggy whips anymore, but we do have Teslas. <laughs> it's, you know, it is a good thing over time. The question is, how do we do this and let this system work and still provide the safety net so that we're, you know, we're a compassionate society and all of that. And I think that's that's part of the creative destruction. Right, exactly. And that's where where the safety net comes in and of course the response to the Great Depression and the Roosevelt administration's response to the Great Depression was actually recognizing that you needed more of a safety net in a capitalist economy and that the two are compatible and, and necessary. And But the choices that, that the American people and American policy uh, makers and the business community need to deal with is making sure that you are not crippling the economy with regulation or with legislation and that but you are providing a safety net at the same time and that's where the balance has to come in right now we talked about capitalism being an organic system and it has changed over time dramatically i mean you know our society started with almost no government regulation i mean that was you know the the, the independence part was to to get away from that and very few taxes. So we have changed over time. We've we've instituted lots of regulations at at many government levels. We've you know we've morphed in terms of you know what our requirements are for for companies. But but talk about the needs of society and how they interact with this evolution of capitalism. So and this is where capitalism is directly linked to the common good, and. You can't forget that very important principle that this is just not about enriching individuals or particular businesses, but it's directly linked to the common good. And I'd just like to quote there was one of the founding documents of CED uh, that had the guiding principles for a post war economy that really tried to grapple with what is the role of public policy, what is the role of business. And if I could just share that statement with you about uh, what the guiding principles of a capitalist economy are, particularly in the American view. And it's an economic system, CD said, based on private enterprise uh, that can better serve the common good. That is the first sentence. And it's not because it enables some men to enrich themselves, but because it develops a high and rapidly rising standard of living. It can provide for the maximum economic opportunity for the largest number of individuals in the community. It can foster the development of the native capacity, ambition, and resourcefulness of the individuals and protect the personal freedom and well-being of the individual from the dangers inherent in too great a concentration of either private or public power. And so that's the essence of providing for the common good and making sure that there's not this, what we now call crony capitalism, this concentration of either private or public power. And so it's so important that business leaders engage in public policy, engage in the public square in order to make sure that capitalism is being responsive to public needs uh, public safety net, and still allowing innovation and the economy to grow. And I keep coming back to innovation because that really is uh, the engine of um, capitalism and, and its greatest gift in terms of economic expansion. Wow. Those, those were really powerful words. We're talking with uh, Lori Esposito Murray about the benefits of capitalism and also the challenges that capitalism faces. We'll go into talking about uh, the path that our economic system needs to take to maintain its sustainability. Well, it's going to take a short break. We'll be right back with conversation on capitalism. Interested in this content? You can find this and much more at our Conference Board website, www.conference-board.org. Or even better, contact our membership team and your company can enjoy the benefits of our in-depth research around the economy, environmental, social, and governance issues, public policy, marketing and communications, and human capital. As a member of the Conference Board, you will be able to have full access to all of our cutting edge research, leading indicators, benchmarking and data services, in addition to webcasts and podcasts such as the one you are enjoying now. Welcome back to C-Suite Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by the president of our Public Policy Center, the Committee for Economic Development, Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray. 
Lori, this has been a fascinating conversation. I, I want to go back for a minute to you know, this whole debate about socialism versus capitalism. You know, when you talk to millennials today, they say, you know, more than half say in some polls, we'd rather live in a socialist country than a capitalist country. I don't think they mean that, honestly. But what 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 is driving that? What is it that they are saying that they want in those polls? Before I get to that, Steve, I just want our audience to realize the importance of millennials. So millennials who basically are 25 to 40 year olds have surpassed the baby boomers as the largest group in America. That's just not right, Lori. It, the two of us being baby boomers, it, it just, it, it, it really hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> well, and we're, we're also 35% of the American, uh, the millennials are 35% of the American workforce. So we've been uh, displaced by them as ah. well, the largest generation in the workforce, which is why your question is so important, Steve, because it really is fundamental to capitalism. They're the largest uh, members of the workforce uh, as a group. And so what's going on with millennials? And what's interesting is that the polling data actually is much more complicated than a simple they're for socialism. They actually are also for capitalism. And so while they lean, uh, you know, they're they're the group that uh, of the generations that are much more favorable to socialism, as are the Generation Z coming up behind them, uh, they really still do believe in capitalism as a system. And their concerns about capitalism uh, really is reflective of their, their experience as the generation that went through the Great Recession, the generation that has watched their parents' situation in terms of the evolution towards globalization. Uh, but what they're really concerned about is the economy working for them. They're really concerned about their job, being able to get a job, uh, the debt from their student loans, but not being able to get a job, not feeling they have that sense of mobility. Ability. But you have to remember when you're looking, when you're talking about millennials, millennials are the entrepreneurial generation. They are the ones who grew up reading, living and reading about Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and wearing black turtlenecks, thinking that that might be their key to success. And so they fundamentally believe in capitalism, but they think Europe, European socialism is much more responsive uh, to their populations. Yeah, I think I think that the, the, I, I didn't know about the black turtleneck part, but you know that that could be the key driver here. But you know, you don't see any of them moving to Venezuela, right? So it, they they really don't want to embrace socialism. I think what I think what they're saying is that they want equality of opportunity, they want equality of access, they want. And I think through that Great Recession, there were so many people, particularly at the bottom end, that were displaced from that, and. Uh, and there was anger towards the banks and all of that. I, and so I, I, I think you're right. I think it's about, by the way, I, I don't think that that's a big difference from baby boomers and other generations, particularly when you go back and you read that CED comment, which you know was 75, 80 years ago, the founding saying how important capitalism is. So there, I, I think it's just, it, to me, it comes down to semantics, but those semantics matter. And, and that's what worries me. I, how do you feel about it? Uh, it, they they do matter, and what's what's interesting is they do matter because it does set the the framework for a debate on the role of government, right? Uh, right. And and it, and and it does imply a very expansive role of government, which unless you have a real debate and unless you have bipartisan approach to issues, and and I think this is so fundamental to the success of our economy and our public policy uh, and our development of a safety net, unless you really do have bipartisan uh, engagement on these issues, you're not going to get to a resolution of what the role of government is. Uh, you can't ram once, one side can't ram something through and the other side can't ram something through, which is where we seem to be finding ourselves as a, as a nation in terms of uh, our public policy um, procedures, developments. Uh, but it's it's you really got to find that balance, and the balance is really important. I mean, we do need a safety net, uh, as we talked about earlier. Uh, but we do need an economy that is not hampered by regulation, uh, not overburdened by um, uh, extensive tax system that kills uh, innovation. Uh, you need to find that balance, and the only way we're going to find that balance is is uh, through bipartisan dialogue. Amen. And and so what role should business leaders play here? Because, you know, you, you've been public on saying, you know, business leaders should should not engage in raw, naked politics, you know, because that's because there's a lot of stakeholders that they represent and everybody's got a different view. 
but I think you you know this whole engage in the in the public policy square is a lot different than politics, and that's that's what you're encouraging. Yes, and that's what CED in that in the founding statements that I read you. That's it. The, it's the business leader's role. This is what we have been for since our founding, and this has not changed. Uh, what's changed are the challenges, not the need for business leaders to be involved in the public square. To be, they are stewards of a market based economy. Uh, they are the stewards of a market-based economy, and they have a responsibility. They have a responsibility to maintain the integrity uh, and the moral compass of capitalism and its, its responsibilities to the common good. And they, have, they are front and center in making sure that the economy stays dynamic and innovative and that there's mobility for the labor force. And most importantly, in this post-COVID post-pandemic economy, Steve, it is, you can't underestimate how important it is in terms of job training, upskilling, providing those opportunities. We've had the infusion of technology accelerated during COVID. The jobs that were uh, hit the most, the people who were hit the most were at the uh, lower end of the education and skill level jobs got hit the worst. They are coming back into an economy where technology has been accelerated and infused into the economy. It is really incumbent upon business leaders to make sure that they are training and upskilling not only those coming back into the economy and the new members of the economy, uh, the younger members of the economy coming in, but making sure that it's a lifetime uh, upskilling for current members of the economy so that we can keep innovating, we keep having good jobs, and we keep having good paying jobs. So you've really, I, I think you, you've, you've really set the table here to say that capitalism is the system that drives the ability for equality. It is the system that drives fairness. It is the system that raises people out of poverty. It does have some flaws and it does have some watch outs that business leaders need to stand up and and help to evolve capitalism so that it does play the role that it needs to play in society. I think that's basically what you're saying here. Yes, and and Steve, you know, it's 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 not just an opinion; it's based on data. You can't right. no, you exactly can't right. ignore how many boats were lifted, how much poverty ended under uh, a free market capitalist uh, economic system. You, you can't ignore the data. So, last question: What is your advice to the people who you know who have doubts about capitalism? So. My, my biggest advice uh, at this time, at this historic time, this transitional time that we're dealing with, uh, where we're seeing titanic shifts due to uh, the pandemic's impact um, on the economy, both negative and positive, as I mentioned, the technology infusion, it is and should be a very positive, innovative um, element to keeping the economic system alive and well and flourishing. And so... Instead of looking at what's wrong, we need to, and spending time, uh, wasting time, looking at what's wrong with the system, we need to identify the problems and come up with the solutions. And engage and get involved. Exactly. Right? Exactly. In, in a constructive way. Exactly. We've been talking to Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray about the role of capitalism in society. Lori, thanks so much for joining us and providing our listeners with some historical context, some some data and some real insight into the today's uh, challenges of capitalism. Oh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is such an important topic and it's such an important time in our history, uh, not only in the U.S., but also globally. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to um, try and find solutions with you. And thanks to all of you for listening to C-Suite Perspectives. You know, every few weeks, I'll be joined by a leader from one of our centers or other business executives to provide insights for what's ahead on the issues of our time. We'll cover the leading topics in public policy, environmental, social, and governance, marketing and communications, the economy, human capital, and whatever else we come up with. Please share your C-suite perspectives with your colleagues, pass it on, and, uh, and enjoy the future episodes. I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast series from the Conference Board that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead to the nation's business leaders. Find this podcast and others from the Conference Board 
wherever you find your podcasts.